Welcome back everyone, Michael here with Offshore Citizen. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about kind of a niche subject, which is the concept of sharding and scalability within blockchains. So this is a little bit of a technical explanation, but I do think it's useful to understand for people who are going out there and looking at different technologies, looking at doing different things in crypto, etc. And so today I'm going to talk about what they sometimes call the trilemma, which is the idea that you can't have decentralization, security, and scalability. Uh, you can only have two of three. And you know, how does this work? Can you actually have it? What are the trade-offs? And we'll kind of break down some of the marketing BS that is out there on a bunch of different projects. So this may give you some ideas of projects that you may be interested in looking at investing in, but also understanding uh, what projects are likely to be able to get a lot of more users, which are more differentiated, what are some of the technical challenges, etc. So let's dive in. Before we do, if you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button, hit the all notification bell. If you'd like help with relocating abroad, with setting up companies and bank accounts and you know, crypto projects and investing abroad and paying lower taxes, etc., please reach out to me. You can book a call, calendar.com forward slash Michael Dash Rosmer, link in the description below or send a message to our websites, offshorecitizen.net and offshorecapitalist.com. So let's just discuss a little bit about scalability. And I'm compelled to say this a little bit because I go to various different conferences once in a while where I see different promotional material and it's just such BS. It's, there, there's so much where somebody takes some little marketing jargon and throws it up there and there's no substance behind it and if you understand kind of the technical side of it behind what they're discussing, it's like, yeah, right, probably not. So let's start with this basic, uh, basic concept. So uh, the idea behind uh, blockchains, let's take Bitcoin as an example, is that you want to have a high degree of decentralization and a high degree of security. Okay? So you can get decentralization uh, without having uh, security and you can get security without having decentralization, but you want both. And this is what allows you to maintain an open permissionless censorship resistant network, essentially. And so what does decentralization mean? It essentially means that there are many, many, many uh, miners and node operators. Okay, node operators happen to be kind of really important in this, not just mining capacity. And you can start to look at, all right, there's different ways of measuring decentralization, for example, how many, how much mining hash power is there? How many entities are there behind the hash power? What about geographies? What about uh, legal jurisdictions, et cetera, et cetera, right? And the idea is to not have any points of failure or no single point of failure, okay? So that's, that's really key. Uh, it turns out that this is related to security, for sure, because uh, if you can set up a very decentralized system, it can be harder to attack the network, okay? So that's just a basic concept. Now, the, what, is, what is the problem with this? Well, the problem with it is that anytime you have a very decentralized system, you're inherently going to end up in a situation where you're gonna compromise either speed or security, okay? Um, why is this? Well, let's say that I try and do a transaction. If I have a very decentralized system, that transaction needs to propagate through many, many computers, okay? In other words, all the computers on the network need to basically validate that same transaction and say, yep, it's valid and confirm it. And so if that has to go through thousands or ten thousands of thousands or hundreds of thousands of computers, it's certainly slower than if it has to go through a single computer. Okay, so this is just a basic, uh, basic requirement. Now, what ends up happening is you can say, all right, well, that all, that all makes sense. Why can't I, if you tell me that I can have security, and this, why, why can't I do it that way? Or how can I possibly have security uh, without having decentralization? And you can see this with, say, for example, bank security, right? Or, you know, Microsoft or Google or something like that, the security that they have. And so the whole point is they don't replicate nearly so many times, et cetera. And uh, let's just use a simple example here. So you could have fewer computers that were doing the verification, and that's fine. Uh, you can get it to be very secure in that way. For example, you could have a tremendous amount of hash power, which makes it secure, uh, but from very few operators, which means that it's not decentralized, which means that they have a lot of power to 
sensor for transactions or take it in one direction versus another. Okay, that's kind of the loose idea. So I hope you kind of understand these concepts. If not, it might be, you can look up uh, various different, very different terms. But the bottom line is that there's a certain amount of power that runs the network and then there's a certain amount that protects the network. And these two things are not the same, okay? So, the big narrative has been we've solved the trilemma. You would hear this from projects such as Algorand, from maybe Elrond, from a bunch of different chains. I recently interviewed the founder of Phantom, uh, Michael Kong, and it was great when we were talking beforehand. He's like, I will quite clearly tell you, we haven't solved it, you know? I was like, oh, thank God, somebody who comes out and is, uh, and is honest about this. So let's just talk about like why this is a problem. Because I think that what I've noticed in marketing material is people can claim whatever they want. They can claim, oh, you know, one second time to finality and we've got 100,000 transactions per second. All right, so if you just think about how this works, every transaction, needs to be sent over a network, okay? This means that the information needs to be communicated from one computer to another, potentially to another, to another, to another, and so on. And at the same time, that computer that receives it needs to process it and store it. So it's going to store a record of transactions, which the more transactions there are, the larger the storage becomes. And so to give some idea, I think last time I checked the Ethereum state, as they would call it, uh, basically, the, the history of transactions, run a full archive node anyway on Ethereum, is about uh, six or nine terabytes, something like that. Solana is, I think, over 20 terabytes. Uh, Bitcoin is a few hundred uh, gigabytes. Okay, so because of the fact that uh, uh, Bitcoin is processing so many fewer transactions, the record of transactions is growing much more slowly than these others because each transaction takes up a certain amount of space and so if you have seven transactions per second well you know you can just start adding up how much space that's going to take versus if you're doing 50,000 transactions per second you can get some idea of how much space that's going to take and so this inherently causes problems you notice we have this contrast here of speed right hey listen i want to be very fast and decentralization decentralization requires that there's many computers the problem is, if you're trying to store 20 terabytes, how many computers can do that? Not a lot, right? If you just think your home computer maybe has one terabyte of hard drive space, something like that, well, if you need to store a lot more than that, 20 terabytes, say, you're going to have a problem. And what this is going to mean is fewer people can run nodes, which is going to mean that there's less decentralization. Okay, that's the trade-off. Uh, in terms of this processing time, I mean, there's some basic physics that happen here, and you can simply understand it this way. You can understand that the slowest thing is the communication latency, meaning the amount of time it takes a signal to go from one place to another is the slowest part of the process. All right, so it's about 150 milliseconds to go from one side of the world to the other, and so that gives you a loop. So a round trip is about 300 milliseconds, and so this is like about as fast as something can happen because I have to send a signal there and I have to have it come back. And you can measure, you can just note that when you're measuring network latency, you're measuring in milliseconds, that's thousandth of a second. Then if you were to look at something like, uh, say, hard drive speed, traditionally we would have, say, microseconds, right, or uh, something like that. And then you can get gigahertz on a processor is nanoseconds, right? So it just kind of tells you processing tends to be faster than storage, which tends to be faster than uh, network overhead, okay? And so this is the biggest bottleneck, followed by this, followed by this. And, you know, we can introduce RAM in there and we can talk about, you know, are we talking about NVMe hard drives or are we talking about SSD hard drives or HDD drives? And, you know, you can get into all sorts of complex conversations about that. And, you know, do you get latency by having the signal to go through multiple hops? And what about, you know, going through satellites as opposed to going through fiber optic and, you know, all this stuff. But basically the speed of light is your limitating factor in terms of transferring data from one side of the world to the other. And if it needs to propagate through multiple hops, then that's going to be slower. And if it has to take an indirect route, that's going to be slower and so on and so forth. Okay. So in other words, when you do a transaction on any network, what happens is you have the transaction on your device and you send it to some computer. And that computer is then going to process it and then typically is going to share it with the network. 
And so there is a communication latency going from your computer to the computer here. This computer has to process it. That's going to take some measure of time. And then it's going to propagate that to somewhere else. And there's usually going to be a back and forth uh, communication in each stage because you have to make sure that the signal was actually received. And then usually there's some sort of error checking built in there, et cetera. So, you know, I'm kind of grossly oversimplifying something that's actually fairly complex. All right. So with this in mind, there is kind of some basic logic that applies to scaling up any network. In this particular case, we're talking about a blockchain or decentralized ledger technology network. Okay. What can you do in order to make things go faster and in order to process more transactions? Well, one is you can use a more powerful computer. And so I'll hear these people who say, you know, this network can do X thousands of transactions. This is nonsense. The truth is the network can only go as fast as the computer that is processing them uh, is able to process them. That's just it. That, that's the limitation. It doesn't matter if you have a faster consensus algorithm. It doesn't matter about all these things. Yes, there are different things that factor into how fast a computer can process it. So for example, uh, one of the things that Phantom, the network is working on right now, is uh, building what they call the Phantom Virtual Machine to replace the Ethereum Virtual Machine because the Ethereum Virtual Machine is very slow. And this has partly to do with the fact that there is uh, what's called a Merkle tree structure. And so basically, as you get more and more data, the lookup time becomes longer, uh, which slows things down. And so you can compare. Likewise, uh, Elrond has their own virtual machine, which is much, much faster than the Ethereum virtual machine. And this means that uh, you know, the Ethereum virtual machine will slow things down, bottom line. So you can, you can optimize in that. But at the end of the day, you're still limited by just how fast the computer that you're running is. And any computer that you're running can only handle so many transactions per second. That's it. And the smaller that computer is, like your laptop is not going to be able to handle the same as my gaming PC, which is not going to be able to handle the same as a major server, right? And so if we want to process more transactions, what we need to do is we need to either uh, decrease the amount of information that is going through in each transaction, right? So we can do some optimizations with the virtual machine and things like that, okay? But that really only gets you, it doesn't get you a lot of distance, right? Let's say you can cut it in half. You can only reduce it by so much before you hit some limit, theoretical limitation because there's just so much information to process, okay? And you want to be able to process more information because it gives you richer applications. So. Realistically, that's not a very good way to be able to scale it. So the next thing that you can do is you can use a more powerful computer. What's the consequence of using a more powerful computer? It means that normal people can't validate the transactions, okay? Because your MacBook Pro or your HP Envy whatever computer uh, can't go and it just doesn't have the processing power that something else does. So maybe it can process, I don't know, let's just say as a random example, that it could process 100 transactions per second, okay? That's it, that's the limitation. It doesn't matter, it, it's not limited by anything except for the hardware in that case, okay? Or at least, no matter what, it will be limited by the hardware. So what, what is the consequence of this? Well, the idea of Bitcoin was that everybody could have this philosophy of what we call don't trust, verify, right? In other words, you could literally download the entire blockchain uh, Bitcoin history and you could verify from the Genesis block to the present to make sure that the hashes were all correct, everything adds up, and you have the correct number of Bitcoins, etc. There's no double spends, there's no invalid transactions on there. It's all good. And this happens to be a hugely fantastic characteristic of Bitcoin, which is hard to replicate in really any other system, I would say. So Ethereum, you can do it, but not nearly as well. Uh, and various others, that it becomes virtually impossible. Like Solana is basically impossible. You pretty much can't get the data. Now, what's, what's, so, what's the big deal here is you don't, if in that case, just need to be able to process the transactions. You need to be able to process the whole history, which means you need to be able to process the transactions faster than the new ones are coming in in order to catch up to the history. And you need to be able to catch up within some reasonable period of time, right? Say a day or a week or whatever. If you start getting beyond that, it takes you two years to process enough transactions to get caught up to the present. It's not very viable. So anyway, the, the consequence is you will lose decentralization if you try to scale up vertically. And this is the strategy that Solana is doing, right? Solana says, okay, great. Instead of running on, you know, some 
little laptop with Raspberry Pi. Opera Raspberry Pi is like a form of uh, operating system. Basically, basically, it's a very lightweight installation, right? So it's very cheap and easy to run. So instead of running on that, you're going to run on uh, Anatoly will say a five thousand dollar gaming PC. In reality, it's probably a little bit more high end than that, but you know, say a ten thousand uh, dollar computer with a one gigabit internet connection. Okay, great, you can do that. Say like not too too crazy, but it rules out a lot of people from doing this unless they're determined to do it. Okay. Uh, and what if you want to scale up a factor of 10? Well, now you need to go much more expensive hardware, hardware and much more. And at some point you get to a stage where you need, you know, an entire server farm in order to process the volume of transactions. And now you're basically replicating Facebook and Google and these other guys, right? So you don't want to end up in that situation. So how do we deal with this problem? Uh, the other way to deal with it is to break it up into pieces and have individual computers only handle uh, a certain volume of the overall transaction load and the overall history. Okay, so this is what we call sharding. Okay, and by the way, this happens in centralized as well as decentralized systems. So, for example, if you go and you create uh, some website, your website probably has like a MySQL database in it that is helping it. To, basically, it's just keeping track of all the information on the site and serving it up to the users. And if you want to, you know go and look at an alternative, maybe you have like a MongoDB database and if you want to get more than a certain amount of information in a MongoDB database, you need to start running multiple servers and you do something called horizontal scaling, which is where you just keep adding more and each of them has a certain share of the database. So just really quickly here, what is a database? A database is simply uh, an organizational structure of records of data. Okay, so uh, the most basic is what we call key value pairs. So this is, you know, have uh, let's say name equals Michael. Our first name equals Michael, last name equals Rosmer. So the key would be first name, the value would be uh, Michael, right? So, and so basically you've got this, all this information, and that information needs to be stored in a structured way that's easy to find and to do things with it. And so you say, okay, well this computer is going to carry all of this portion, and this other computer is going to carry this other portion, and we're going to combine them together and they're going to work together, okay? And so you can do the same thing with something like uh, blockchains, right? Is instead of having to have this computer process 100,000 transactions per second, it only needs to process 1,000 because there's 100 different shards and each one's processing you know, 1,000 transactions per second. And so between the shards, you get 100,000 transactions per second that can throughput. So that's uh, basically the idea. Um, so hopefully this makes sense. You either use bigger computers, bigger computers means that you lose decentralization, right? Or you break it up into smaller pieces so that you can have weaker computers uh, that are still handling it and you can maintain decentralization. What is the downside of maintaining decentralization? Well, the concern is that in the process of doing this thing where you have many shards, that you lose security, right? Meaning that, let's say we're talking about uh, proof of stake algorithm. And so the people who are running validator nodes need to put up some sort of tokens that they're going to walk up to provide security to the network. Well, you would typically, the, the tendency is going to be that you have to break off this security on a per shard basis. So now you have 100 shards, but each one only has 100th of the security that the overall system had and you can attack an individual shard, which makes it more complex to go after. And you can look at different attempts at solving this. Interesting uh, attempts to solve it. So Ethereum is uh, with ETH2 working on sharding. Uh, Near, which is a really cool protocol, uh, is doing sharding. Uh, Harmony is doing sharding. Uh, Elrond is doing sharding. There's a bunch of others that are doing various different types of sharding. But these are, I think, four interesting ones you can take a look at as different models of sharding. Polkadot essentially is all about sharding and the communication between different shards, etc. So yeah, very lengthy explanation. Hopefully it made sense to you. If you have questions about it, put it in the comments below. I think why it's useful for you to understand. First of all, I mean, I'm, I like to geek out and pay attention to technical things, but and to actually understand how they work, because when you understand how they work, 
you can see sort of through some of the bullshit that comes in marketing. But I also think it gives some sense of which of the projects that may have some advantage in the future. And as a result, you know, what is it that uh, you maybe want to invest in or where would you want to build projects or where would you like to go experiment, etc. So hope that helps and I will look forward to seeing you guys on the next video.